Good evening. Nkrumah Chere. I hope everybody is having a great evening. That you are all safe and sound and in good health. Tonight, I will be starting a book reading authored by Osajifo Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, this book was written in 1968. The title is called Dark Days in Ghana. This book is a expose and it, it well let me just explain first of all that what it will do what it has done it exposed the true nature of the military police take over after the overthrow of the constitutional government of Ghana on February 24th, 1966. Chronicle those actions, the forces which participated in the coup d'etat, uh, those forces that were behind it in support, how it affected the people, and um, how how Ghana was thrown open to Western capital, and how they really just took over uh, every industry that was built by the Ghana Republic. And um, President Krumah also demolished the lie that was told that the country needed to be rescued from economic chaos, mismanagement, which was a outright lie. And it also set forth his views on the struggle against imperialism and neocolonialism on the African continent. So I'm going to just get into that now. Tonight, I'm just going to go into uh, sort of the first chapter. And I'll start with the dedication he wrote to Major General Barwa, Lieutenant S. Arthur and Lieutenant M. Eboa, and all Ghanaians killed and injured resisting the traitors of, of the 24th February 1966. And the author's note, which states Ghana's experience since 24th February 1966, costly but priceless must be viewed in the context of the African Revolution as a whole. It is with this in mind that I have written in Conakry about Ghana's quote-unquote dark days in the hope that publication of the facts may help to expose similar setbacks in other progressive independent African states. Conakry, Guinea, 15th April, 1968. So let us begin the first chapter, Peking to Conakry. The word coup should not be used to describe what took place in Ghana 
on 24th February 1966. On that day, Ghana was captured by traitors among the army and police who were inspired and helped by neo-colonialists and certain reactionary elements among our population. It was an act of aggression, an invasion, planned to take place in my absence and to be maintained by force. Seldom in history has a more cowardly and criminally stupid attempt been made to destroy the independence of a nation. When the action took place, I was on my way to Hanoi at the invitation of President Ho Chi Minh with proposals for ending the war in Vietnam. I had almost reached Peking, the furthest point in my journey. The cowards who seized power by force of arms behind my back knew they did not have the support of the people of Ghana and therefore thought it safer to wait until I had not only left the country, but was well beyond the range of a quick return. The news was brought to me by the Chinese ambassador in Accra, who had gone ahead to Peking to meet me and to be with me during my visit in China. He had just accompanied Minister Cho Enlai and other officials when they welcomed us at the airport. And he had come straight on out to the government house where I was staying. I remember his exact words. Mr. President, I have bad news. There has been a coup d'etat in Ghana. I, I was taking a brief rest after the long flight from my boom and wondered if I had heard him correctly. What did you say? A coup in Ghana? Impossible, I said. But yes, it is possible. These things do happen. They are in the nature of the revolutionary struggle. I later learned that the Chinese welcoming party had known about events in Ghana when I stepped from the aircraft at Peking, but with char characteristic courtesy had waited to break the news to me privately. My first reaction was to return immediately to Accra. If the VC-10 of Ghana Airways, in which we had traveled most of the way, had been in Peking, I would have embarked at once. But we had left it behind in Ragoon and had continued to Peking in an aircraft sent by the Chinese government. I knew that to avoid unnecessary bloodshed, I would have to be back in Ghana within 24 hours, and this was clearly impossible. I decided, therefore, to make an immediate statement to the Ghanaian people and to fight back on African soil just as soon as my host could make the necessary travel arrangement. What happened in Ghana was no more than a tactical setback in the African revolutionary struggle of a type which I had often predicted. At the very first conference of the Organization of African Unity in Addis Ababa, I warned my fellow heads of state that none of us was safe if we remained dis disunited. For this reason, I considered that the overall strategy remained unchanged, but what had happened in Ghana made it all the more necessary to press on by revolutionary means to secure a united Africa. The following is the text of the statement I released to the press. On my arrival in Peking, my attention had been drawn to reports from press agencies which alleged that some members of the Ghana Armed Forces supported by some members of the police have attempted to overthrow my government, the government of the Convention's People's Party. I know that the Ghanaian people are always loyal to me, the party and the government, and all I expect of everyone at this hour of trial is to remain calm but firm in determination and resistance. Officers and men in the Ghana Armed Forces who are involved in this attempt are ordered to return to their barracks and wait for my return. I am the constitutional head of the, of the Republic of Ghana and the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces. I am returning to Ghana soon. I followed this up with a cable to all Ghanaian embassies. 
which stated, Be calm and remain firm at your post. Send all messages and reports to me through the Ghana Embassy Peking, and not, repeat not, through a crawl until further notice. As I discussed the news from Ghana with the 22 officials accompanying me, among them A. Kwezan Saki, Foreign Minister, Kwezi Arma, Minister of Trade, and M. F. Dene, Ambassador Extraordinary in charge of the African Affairs Secretariat, J. E. Bosman, Ambassador to the UK, F. Arkhurst, Ghana's Permanent Representative to the United Nations, I was somewhat disappointed to note their reaction. At a time like this, I would have expected them to show courage and fortitude, but most of them were frightened. Kwezon Saki, for example, developed diarrhea and must have visited the laboratory about 20 times that day. Their obvious dismay was in striking contrast to the calmness and courage of the 66 other personnel, the security officers and members of my personal secretariat. These were men. Compared with them, the politicians were old women. With Alex Kwezon Saki, I will deal later. I will deal later. Queasy Arma settled down in London where it appeared that he had considerable funds of money available to him. The rebel regime on the basis of this attempted to have him extradited on the grounds that he had stolen the money in question. His many trials before the English courts exposed at least the falsity of the allegations which these authorities had made. I am glad that he was acquitted since I am sure of the particular charges made against him were false. Nonetheless, I believe that he bought his misfortunes on himself by failing to take a positive, a positive political stand. His various court cases, however, proved the nonsense contained in many of the allegations of corruption against my government. <clears throat> Enoch Okoy and Michael Dean were old British trained civil servants. They had made their way up through the colonial structure. They had been among my most trusted officials, but they chose to return to Ghana, presumably in hope that they would be accepted by the counter revolutionaries. Enoch Okoy, as head of the civil service, and as a person who knew, therefore, which promotions had been made and why, was treated with leniency and was appointed to be in charge of the housing corporation. Since the new regime did not intend to build any, any houses for the people, this was perhaps the appropriate punishment for his desertion. Michael de Yang was not so treated and much to his surprise was thrown in prison. Fred Arkhurst, after his treachery, returned to his former position at the United Nations, but was eventually removed by the NLC, who could not trust someone who had the least ability. Naturally, we were all of us anxious about the safety of our families in Ghana. But I suppose the official members of the party were also thinking about their bank accounts and their property. It is said that a man's heart lies where his treasure is. But even allowing for the fact that they had more to lose than the other personnel, I still find it hard to understand how they could have lost grip of themselves so easily. It was as though they had put their hands up at the first whiff of danger. However, they didn't manage to pull themselves together sufficiently for me to be able to discuss the next moves with them. It was not until later, after they had left Peking and were on their own, that the full death of their defeatism became apparent, and they deserted. We agreed that for the next day or two, while arrangements were being made, I should carry out official engagements as planned. This was also the wish of the Chinese government. The Chinese made it clear that they regarded the military and police action in Ghana as no more than a temporary obstacle in the long struggle against imperialism, the kind of event to be expected, but which had no effect whatsoever on the final outcome. Quote, you are a young man, Chao Wen Lai told me. You have another 40 years ahead of you, end quote. 
at the banquet held in my honor on 24th February, the Chinese spoke of Afro-Asian solidarity in the African people's revolutionary struggle. He said the following, most of the African countries have won independence, but the African people's revolutionary struggle against imperialism is by no means completed. They still have to carry on this struggle in greater depth. The imperialists headed by the United States are more active than ever in pressing forward with their policies of neocolonialism in an attempt to subvert independent African countries and suppress the anti-imperialist revolutionary struggle of the African peoples. In his latest book, Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism, President Nkrumah gave a detailed description of neocolonialism and implicitly pointed out that foremost among the neocolonialists is the United States, which is at the very citadel of neocolonialism. However hard the imperialists may whip up revolutionary adverse currents, the anti-imperialist revolutionary struggles of the African peoples can never be suppressed, but are bound to win final victory. The Chinese people have unswervingly stood on the side of the African peoples and resolutely support their just struggles. End quote. He went on to condemn U.S. policy in Vietnam and to expose the hypocrisy of American so-called peace moves. No direct mention was made of the news from Ghana or the possibility that I might not proceed to Hanoi. In my reply, I also attacked neocolonialism. I said that final victory would rest with the common man. I went on to condemn U.S. aggression in Vietnam and called for the complete withdrawal of all American forces from Vietnam so that peace negotiation could begin. I knew that I could not now go to Hanoi. My first duty lie with the people of Ghana, and I was determined to return to Africa as quickly as possible. But I was sorry to have to abandon my mission, as it was the second time that President Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh asked me to go. And I wanted to do everything I could to help in the war. I was, as far as I know, still remain the only head of state or government that the president of North Vietnam had invited to Illinois to discuss the war since the American phase began. When I informed him of my decision, he replied that I would be welcome in Hanoi at any future date. During the next two days, while I continued to carry out official engagements and to deal with the messages which began to pour in from abroad, the Chinese could not have shown greater care for my safety. If anyone near to me so much as put his hand in his pocket, he was instantly pounced upon by security officers. They trusted no one, not even the Ghanaians who were with me. Messages of encouragement and support continued to arrive from heads of state and governments from all over the world. Many African leaders offered me immediate hospitality. Among them were President Sekou Touré of Guinea, President Nasser of Egypt, President Nairobi of Tan Tan Tanzania, and President Mobido Kita of Mali. I was very touched that they should declare their solidarity so quickly and with such generosity, and it was only after deep thought that I decided to accept the invitation of President Sekou Touré and the political bureau of the Guinean Democratic Party. I sent the following note to President Sekou Touré, Peking, 25th, February, 1966. My dear brother and president, I have been deeply touched by your message of solidarity and support I have received today. It is true, as you say, that this incident in Ghana is a plot by the imperialists, neo-colonialists, and their agents in Africa. As these imperialist forces grew, grow more militant and insidious, using traitors to the African cause against the freedom and independence of our people, we must strengthen our resolution and fight for the dignity of our people to the last man and for the unity of Africa. It is heartening to know that in this struggle, 
we can count on the support and understanding of Africa's well-tried leaders like yourself. I know that our case, our cause will triumph and that we can look forward to the day when Africa shall be really united and free from foreign interference and the intrigues and saboteurs of puppets. I am safe and well here in Peking, and I have sent my special emissary who will deliver the message to you to let you know the plans I am making for my early return to Africa. I trust that you will give him every possible assistance for the fulfillment of his mission. I will visit you in Guinea soon with sincere and brotherly affection. <clears throat> Shortly afterwards, I received a further message from President Sekou Toure. He said, the political bureau and the government, after a thorough analysis of the African situation following the seizure of power by the instruments of imperialism, have decided to one, to organize a national day of solidarity with the Guinean people, uh, correction, with the Guinean people next Sunday. Throughout the length and breadth of the country, they will take place popular demonstrations on the theme of anti-imperialism. Two, to call on all progressive African countries to hold a special conference to take all adequate measures. We think that the time factor is vital here, since it is important to make a reposit without further delay by every means. Your immediate presence will be very opportune, it seems to us, and we are therefore impatiently waiting for you. Yours very fraternally, Ahmad Sekou Touré. I do not propose to publish in full all the message I received from heads of states and governments, but I would like to quote from the messages of two other African leaders. First, the note from President Mobido Kita of Mali. I am happy to hear that you are well. Please thank our comrades of the People's Republic of China for this important contribution to Africa's struggle for liberty and progress. Yesterday, the 24th of February, we learned of the serious events which took place in Ghana and which do no credit to those who have provoked them. For us, the authors of the coup d'etat have committed an act of high treason. This is one phase of the unremitting struggle waged by neo-colonialists and imperialists against Africa, which, which, which wishes to live in freedom and dignity and in friendship with all people who are peace-loving and who wish to build a just society. All Africans, conscious of the grave dangers posed by our people and our continent, shall mobilize themselves to bar the way to neo-colonialism and imperialism. The Malian people consider themselves engaged in the struggle. And uh, let me just, I'll continue on here, um, <clears throat> finish up the first chapter here. I have a few more pages for that, so uh, then that will be all for tonight, and we'll continue tomorrow. Uh, this will be uploaded, hopefully, uh, those who are interested in listening, I'm sure by the morning, sometime early morning, uh, this will be uh, totally uploaded. So let me continue. Secondly, I quote from the message from Albert Margai, the Prime Minister of Sierra Leone. Willis, we are conscious of the many and diverse forces working in Africa which daily and constantly strive to foil our struggle for the final emancipation of those still subject to colonial rule and our ultimate claims to unity I have nevertheless formed great hope and fortitude in the courage of your convictions and determined efforts to defy all odds in refusing to accept the results of the recent revolt as a fait accompli. Please accept, my dear brother, the assistance of my highest consideration, esteem, and prayers for your personal well-being and safety. Apart from the fact that Guinea and Ghana formed a union in 1961, and a strong bond of friendship exists between President Sekou Toure, the political bureau of the Guinean Democratic Party, the people of Guinea and myself. 
I wanted to go to a country as near to Ghana as possible. This would leave no one in any doubt about my intention to take up the neocolonialist challenge and to restore legal government in Ghana. Guinea is only some 300 miles from Ghana. Jet flying time between the two countries is a mere 30 to 40 minutes. From Guinea, I knew I would be in a good position to carry on the African revolutionary struggle. I decided that we should all, with the exception of Kwezan Saki and Bosman, go to Guinea via Moscow. Kwezan Saki, as prime minister, was entrusted with a very important mission. He was to go to Addis Ababa to represent the legal government of Ghana at the OAU conference of foreign ministers, due to open there within a few days. Instead of rising to the occasion and accepting this great challenge and responsibility, he went to Accra and offered his services to the neo-colonialist puppets, the so-called National Liberation Council. The latter, it seems, made little use of him. Traitors have no friends. I heard of his betrayal when I arrived in Moscow on the 1st of March, and it was there that I was also told of Bosman's defection. By then, Kwezi Arma and other officials had left Moscow to deal, as they said, with urgent private matters. They were to return to Moscow, and we were all to travel together to Conakry. Instead, they defected. I then decided to proceed at once to Guinea with my personal entourage and members of my guard detachment. I wanted no one with me who was faint-hearted or two-faced. Every member of my party knew he was free to leave at any time. The security officers and other members of my personal staff decided to remain with me. The Russian government sent an aircraft to Peking to fetch me, and I left from an airstrip near Peking on 28th February. <clears throat> Before leaving, I made the following statement to the press. I think you all know that certain members of my armed forces have attempted to usurp political power in Ghana while I was on the way to Hanoi. What they have done, in fact, is to commit an act of rebellion against the government of the Republic. I am determined to crush, I am determined to crush it without delay. And to do this, I rely upon the support of the Guinean people, on the, I'm sorry, the Ghanaian people and of Ghana's friends in the world. By the arrest, detention, and assassination of ministers, the party's loyal civil servants and trade unionists, and by the massacre of defenseless men and women, the authors of these insane acts of robbery, violence, and anarchy have added brutality to their treason. Never in the history of our new Ghana has citizens, men and women, been assassinated in cold blood. Never had their children become orphans for political reasons. Never before have Ghanaians, our people, been shot because of their political convictions. This is a tragedy of monstrous proportions. The excessive personal ambition and the insane acts of these military adventurers, if not stifled now, will not only destroy the political, economic, and social achievements of the last few years, but it will also obstruct the course of the African Revolution. All that has been achieved by the Ghanaian people, with the assistance of all of our friends, is in jeopardy. I am returning to Ghana. I know that the friendly nations and people of goodwill everywhere will support me in restoring the constitutional government of Ghana. I take this opportunity to express my sincere condolences to all the families whose valiant sons and daughters have given their lives in the defense of Ghana. At this moment, as I leave Peking, the capital city of the People's Republic of China, I express my profound gratitude to the Chinese people and to their leaders for their support and their kind hospitality. We landed near Moscow at dawn on 1st March after a brief stop in Siberia and were met by leading Soviet government officials. After a busy day of talks, I re-embarked at midnight for the flight to Guinea. We touched down briefly in Yugoslavia and in Algeria and reached Conakry in the afternoon of Wednesday, 2nd March. 
It was wonderful to be on African soil again. Eden was agog with excitement. President Sekou Toure and members of the political bureau of the Democratic Party were among the huge crowd at the airport to welcome me. A 21-gun salute was fired in my honor. At a mass rally in the Pack Spirits Sports Stadium in Conakry the following day, President Sekou Toure announced that I had been made Secretary General of the Guinean Democratic Party and Head of State of Guinea. The Ghanaian traders, he said, have been mistaken in thinking that Nkrumah is simply a Ghanaian. He is a universal man. It looked as though the entire population of Conakry was in the stadium that afternoon, and I shall never forget the reception they gave to Sekou Ture and myself as we were driven around the arena in an open car. The crowds rose to their feet, cheering, shouting anti-imperialist and anti-neo-colonialist slogans and waving placards, long live the African Revolution, long live Kwame Nkrumah, long live Sekou Ture, down with neo-colonialists, etc. It was a deeply moving experience. I found my thoughts turning to similar mass rallies held in, in the polo grounds, Accra. The people of Ghana were now being made to suffer for something which was not of their own making. They had been overcome by powerful external forces and by the plotting and deception of a few selfish and ambitious reactionaries. President Sekou Ture made a long speech. I did not know at the time exactly what he said. He spoke in French, and my knowledge of that language was then sketchy. I understood that I had been made... Let me correct that. I understood that I had been presented to the people of Guinea but had no idea that I had been made president. It was not until after the ceremony, when I heard the press reports, that the full realization of my new appointment became clear to me. Such a gesture of political solidarity must surely be without historical precedent. When our historians come to record the events of 1966, they would doubtless consider the action of the Guinean government as such a great landmark and a practical expression of Pan-Africanism. In this way began one of the most fruitful and happiest periods of my life, the time I spent in Conakry, about which I shall write later in this book. Now that is the first chapter, and I hope you found it interesting. We'll be uh, coming back tomorrow evening with uh, the second chapter. And in that second chapter, uh, President Nkrumah covers the actual... Um, the coup d'etat itself, I believe, and uh, let me just look through it again here. And uh, yes, and the actors involved who carried it out. So we'll get into that in detail tomorrow. So at this point in time, we'll end it. But uh, I want to thank all those who have come to listen to that. Uh, DOD, if you're listening, brother, um, I, I wanted to get this out a little early, so if you get a chance uh, on this uploads, um, tell me what you think, and others. Uh, I welcome welcome your comments, and uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a good evening.